The number of children who believe they have been born into the wrong gender is on the increase. There are those who believe this is good, but there are also many in the medical community who believe it is a fact very harmful for children. Our guest today is Dr. Ann Gillies, a professional trauma counselor and author of Closing the Floodgates, Setting the Record Straight about Gender and Sexuality. And here's the book right here. Dr. Ann Gillies, welcome to Bridge City News. Thanks for having me. So how did we reach this point talking about gender dysphoria? What are your thoughts? Well. Ten years ago, did you ever hear that word, gender dysphoria? No, it's just become a phenomenon. Gender dysphoria was actually gender identity disorder, and it's being rephrased in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and it's now gender dysphoria, which is the um, distress. So we're treating the distress. And so things have just uh, continued at a, a very fast momentum. It's highly funded um, by... Um, special interest groups, right? Special interest groups. Several billionaires are funding behind this, and even pharmaceuticals. Yeah, there's a real push. But how did we come to that point where people are self-identifying as another gender? When I was a kid, you know, the boys and the girls, and even if boys wanted to play with dolls, that was fine. But we knew boys were boys and girls were girls. Well, there is a lot of teaching in our school systems and on uh, gender ideology and so children are hearing at a very early age, in fact kindergarten, um, that they can be and they might be even, so it's a suggestive thing, they may be in the wrong body and so certainly our teenagers have heard that, we have a whole generation that's been hearing those things so when you put thoughts in a child's mind, um, I mean especially if you tell a child you can't do that imagine. Some That's children right. just have to try it out. And children's brains are still developing, so isn't there a danger? It's extremely dangerous. Right. In fact, um, children, absolutely, their brain's developing, and a 13-year-old, for instance, their brain is totally reconstructing at that age. In fact, a, a two-year-old brain and a 13-year-old brain look very similar. The, don't get offended at that, it's just the reality of our biology kicks in and the brain has this huge uh, recalibration to grow, grow, grow at that age. So those young adolescents cannot make executive decisions. So Dr. Gillies, let's talk more about outside influences and how much of a role they really play. I think it's a tremendous role and uh, I think there's so much in the school system and now um, schools are um, having to uh, provide special interest groups and those groups um, what we're finding is that children are coming out, adolescents are coming out in clusters as transgender. They're, these um, adults or adolescents are often marginalized children to begin with. They have mental uh, disabilities of some kind. Autism is very high on the transgender scale, like there's a correlation. Oh. So, yeah. So these are our children who are socially a bit awkward, and so they get invited, which is good, right, into a family, a group, right, that will treat them like family as long as they're complicit to the ideology within that group. And that's what we're finding. Now these young women, and some of them had lesbian tendencies before, they are now those uh, even who were lesbian tendencies tend toward lesbian behavior, um, are actually transitioning into the transgender. In fact, uh, the latest stat I read was 37% of uh, lesbian, young lesbian girls are transitioning into transgender. There's a whole uh, there's a whole momentum here, and it's not good. There's divisiveness even within the culture. Now, there are also puberty blockers, hormone blockers, and even gender reassignment surgery yes. in Canada for Abs kids? Absolutely. And the push is to have it younger and younger because right now what we're hearing from... Um, from very progressive thinkers, they call themselves progressive thinkers, um, is that children need to get on these puberty blockers, of course, before puberty, because that will help them so that they will not have a, a difficult time transitioning. What happens with puberty blockers, it blocks puberty, so they never go through the natural course of their development. And it's all based out of fear, like some, 
something's wrong with puberty, you know? Is it a difficult time? Absolutely, it was difficult for every one of us because it's so much transition. But we're so afraid of, of going through the transitions of life. We created this culture of fear for children. So some of these hormone and puberty blockers, do they actually help a lot of the children when it comes to maybe depression or confusion in their lives? They don't help with that at all. All they do is suppress the natural development. And what I want to say here, and really need to uh, em emphasize that, up until about 2006, gender dysphoria was extremely rare, extremely rare, 0.003% of uh, young girls. 0.003%, very rare, and not only that, um, if these chi children were affirmed in their biological sex, they would revert, the gender dysphoria would leave uh, in 88% of girls and up to 97% of boys. That's astronomical percentage mental health wise. So what you're going to see is that these children are now put on puberty blockers instead of affirming their biology. And once they go through that trajectory and go on hormones, they never have a chance of actually re-identifying in the sense of their biology. They can detransist as that's happening, but they will have lifelong effects. So what about rapid onset gender dysphoria? Oh, there we go. Can you explain that to our viewers, what it Absolutely. is exactly? That is a very new category. It's not even in the DSM. It's a new category of children. And so it is uh, predominantly young girls between 15. Now we're seeing younger, 13, I would say, to 24. They are coming out, like I said, in clusters in these groups. So young adolescents. And I said earlier that a 13-year-old's brain is is transitioning and growing in a incredible, um, uh, at an incredible rate, and their thinking gets all distorted. Mm -hmm. And so these are the children that are now coming out as, as, tra um, as transgender, and it's called rapid onset. There is no prior, um, no prior condition. They are just coming home all of a sudden and saying, I'm in the wrong body. In fact, this is a girl's, that's what's being documented, but I had um, someone um, in, uh, that recently, uh, a father, whose son came home, seven years old, the son, and said, I want to be a girl. And three of my friends also want to be a girl, and you're going to help. This person was in the medical profession, and dad, you're going to help us be girls. Is there a problem here? Yes, there's a definite problem. And as a father, I mean, how do you even respond to something like that? Well, the first thing and I will would... will you be charged as a hate crime? Like, well, here maybe we Maybe your go. children are taken away from you? In Ontario, you know? if you do not affirm that child's thoughts, because they're thoughts, and, what they're, and their feelings that they may be in the wrong body, there is a chance, in fact it's happened, that the children can be taken out of your home. Wow. So the, yes, that's very dangerous, but I would say as a parent, if a child comes home and says something like that, I would want to know, I would want to have them explain, so what, what makes you believe that this is really happening, that all of a sudden you're you're wanting to be a girl. Is it maybe from another child? Maybe they had a conversation at the playground somewhere? Because a lot you of times want to get kids respect that. the opinion of other kids of a similar Absolutely. age as opposed to their own parents. Absolutely. And sometimes, you know, they're hearing all this talk and children get out of class after a gender ideology uh, lecture at seven years old, but it's not a lecture. But, you know, here's the, the little coloring thing that we're doing today on gender ideology, and they're hearing all these things, so of course they're going to talk, and they're going to question, well, could that be me? Children are leaving those classrooms, actually, and going home very traumatized in tears. So, yeah. So, Dr. Gillies, as a father myself, you know, and for a mother, how do you respond to something like that when your child comes home and says, I want to be a boy or a girl? You know, well, and I believe that I am, and you should support me in this. Well, that's right. So I think you have to just really go really slow with these kids because they're hearing all of these things. And so to be able to help them um, really articulate what's going on because these children have not had um, a diagnosis. In fact, they are, all these children are self-diagnosing 
right, a medical condition, a, th a, a psychological condition, and it is still a psychological condition, even though there's such a push now to have that taken out of the DSM, um, because we want to keep all these things uh, moving forward progressively. There is an agenda to do that. Well, we help those who have eating disorders, bulimia, anorexia. Mm -hmm. Would this potentially be a mental disorder, or should we maybe encourage and support our children who feel this way? Well, it's still categorized as a mental disorder, and I, I really hope it stays there. Um, these children um, are basically being affirmed and told that their self-diagnosis is correct. Uh, we don't do that with eating disorders. We don't do it with body um, identity, dysphoric identity disorder, which is people that want to amputate a limb. Um, and really, it's because they hate their body. And when you get into the whole area of transgenderism, which used to be called transsexual, there is a body hatred. There's all kinds of underlying abuse and different reasons that people behave the way they do. And we're not even allowed to treat those reasons anymore. Well, it's understandable, of course, that children, they're trying to find their own identity at the age of five or six. But what about adults who've lived, let's say, as a man, or a woman for 50, 60 years and all of a sudden say, you know what, I want to be the other sex. I was actually a man trapped in a woman's body or vice versa for 50 or 60 years. How does that happen? Well, you know, I, I want to be compassionate to the people that are experiencing things mm -hmm. like that and it does happen. And I think, when I think of all that, I just think, sorry, this is, I think selfishness because I, I see what happens, families are destroyed. Everything collapses. Um, so a man wants to be a woman, he's been married, he has several children, so we just leave everything. And just walk away. We walk away and do what we want to do. Sometimes these women are so, um, they're so, they feel like they have to support this ideology, which I, it breaks my heart because I'm saying, no, say no. We are a family. You made a promise to us to love and care for us and to love our children. And so, I mean, I won't get um, checkpoints for talking like this, of course, but it's true. The LGBTQ2 plus community is very strong. Yes. They're getting a lot of influence. They have a lot of support, billions of dollars behind them. So where do you think this is going over the next decade or so? Wow, that's a really good question. Unless people start raise, rising up, standing up, and speaking out, we are in trouble. At the same time, the LGBT community as a whole, I believe it's, it's starting to implode. I also believe there's feminists, both within that culture and without, that are rising up against the trans movement, this is not a pretty thing going on here. And so I think we, as believers, for sure, and people who have the ability to help, need to continue to love and care for those who are struggling. Uh, you have someone in your own family who is leading a gay lifestyle and uh, walked away, right? Absolutely, absolutely, my eldest son. And there's a long story behind that, but I can't get into that today. But, mm -hmm. um, but needless to say, trauma and abuse. And so, um, he was in that lifestyle about 11 years and came out of that lifestyle and because he chose, he made some choices, called me and said, Mom, hey, what's going on? I'm having all this stuff. I'm really struggling. And anyway, started therapy, which he couldn't even get now um, because it was to really address the underlying issues that promote the behavior that he was involved in. And so he's been out of that lifestyle for... Um, about 10 years. He has married. Not everyone that comes out of that lifestyle um, has heterosexual feelings. That's okay, but you can still come out. Um, and he has married and he has children and wow. he is happy. He's very happy. Dr. Ann Gillies, a professional trauma counselor and author of, here it is, Closing the Floodgates, Setting the Record Straight about Gender and Sexuality. Thanks so much for joining me on Bridge City News. Thank you.